Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in this presentation today, I have chosen to be rather eclectic and uh, to speak without any unifying theme. I have opted to roam far and wide, meander here and there. So if there is no thematic coherence in what I say, Mr. Speaker, it's only because of the approach that I have decided to adopt on this occasion. Mr. Speaker, there's a common saying that nothing happens before it's time. These are very simple words. But in my view, they really are profound words of, of wisdom. They are words of advice. And perhaps no other undertaking than that of public life should always take those words into consideration. Because as politicians, sometimes we fail because our timing was wrong. Sometimes we succeed when we least expected to succeed. And really, a lot has to have to do with that, that iron rule that nothing happens before it's time. It means, Mr. Speaker, that if the timing and circumstances are not right, then our plans, whatever they may be, will not materialize. No matter how sincere or noble our instincts or intentions may be. In fact, Mr. Speaker, that may well help to explain why certain politicians are ahead of the time. Why you do certain things at a specific point in time, but those things are rejected until somehow later in the movement of history, the value is understood. In politics, Mr. Speaker, we mirror that thinking by speaking of the political conjuncture. That's a term that political scientists use all the time. We say that a conjuncture must be right to undertake or implement certain policies or take certain actions. But what we simply mean, Mr. Speaker, is that a combination of circumstances must be right or that a particular state of affairs must exist. Likewise, when we speak of the political conjunction, more narrowly defined, we really mean the political circumstances, the real balance of political forces, the mood, sentiments, and prevailing thinking of the electorate or citizenry must be right. And part of the skill of the politician is to know when the circumstances are right. It is that understanding that allows the politician to exercise judgment as to whether to pursue or not to pursue or whether to implement what may have been established before and uh, whether the chances of success are good or failure still attends to the process. I believe, Mr. Speaker, I have shared with colleagues two particular experiences in my life. I think I am sure that I did at one sitting of the House. I illustrated by my experience over the date of Carnival. I'm sure honorable members may remember I mentioned that episode. I 
remember telling them that when I was a young minister designate of education way back in 1980, I decided with the then organizers of Carnival that we would change the date of Carnival to July. And the reasons that are now cited why that change was essential were all championed by us at the time. Giving St. Lucian Carnival its own separate identity. Being in a better position to market Carnival so it doesn't have to compete with Trinidad and Tobago. you will have the ripple effect of allowing St. Lucian Calypsonians to create more songs because they will have to feed their Carnival celebration with their own songs. We did it for a year, but immediately after we lost the general elections in 1982, the decision was reversed. But what a torrid time it was. I was accused of being a communist, of being a sheep, being a wolf in sheep clothing. The church hierarchy was on my back that I was interfering with the practice of the church by preventing by preventing the faithful from observing Ash Wednesday all kinds of manner of, of names calumny but you know Mr. Speaker I live to see the day when organizers of carnival albeit when the Labour administration was in power, changed the date again. Back to what we had experimented with. And this time it was accepted without the usual conflict and without the usual disagreements. And yes, there will always be diehards who tell you Carnival is best celebrated on beyond prior to Ash Wednesday. It must presage Ash Wednesday. It has symbolic value for the practice surrounding Ashland. But the point is, when we first attempted to do it, when we first attempted to do it, we simply did not judge the circumstances right, or put differently, it was simply the wrong time to embark on the initiative. But in my quiet moments, I sit back and reflect on those things and realize that there's a golden lesson in all of this, that we must never ever give up in what we believe. Sometimes we have to beat the drums of retreat, take a step backwards, and then wait for the right moment and the right opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I want to give you a second example that in fact had to do with some amendments to the tax legislation which the Minister of Finance introduced in this House a year or two ago to amend our tax laws. Shortly after assuming power in 1997, the then Labour government decided to undertake a major overhaul of St. Lucia's personal income tax regime. Why? Because we had one of the most backward pieces of legislation to govern tax administration institution. <laughs> I remember we invited the IMF into St. Lucia to do an analysis of the tax legislation and to prepare a draft. No matter what the then Labour administration said, well no matter what I said to people, they insisted that we had every intention to enact that tax legislation and that we were not sincere about consulting people to get their views on what was possible. In fact, I will never forget that <laughs> the, former, former, the former foreign minister of St. Lucia, George Odlum, called me on from some distant land to say that 
called me, which he normally, he never, normally never did, to say that he understands that there is a rebellion in St. Lucia over tax legislation that the government intended to enact. And I, then I explained to him it was no more than draft legislation to put to the electorate for consideration, to put to um, stakeholders, um, to review so that we can extract from it the very best provisions and reform our tax regime. All to no, all to no avail. All to no avail. The talk shows were loud, the attacks and the onslaught unimaginable. Unimaginable. And so the government then had to withdraw. Time passed. Other countries in the Caribbean modernized their tax legislation. St. Lucia languished. Languished with our archaic laws which continue to this day. But lo and behold, in comes the administration of which my friend to my right was a member and the uh, Accountants whom they hired to give them advice, Ernest and Young, on how to prepare a budget indicated that a critical plank was the reform of the taxation system and in fact proposed to recommend what had been rejected when the Labour Party was in office in 1997 and had been put to the public at large. That's the history. Of course, months before, while we were in office, we had attempted to do some tepid reforms to the tax legislation. No? And then it fell to the current Minister of Finance and this government to, again, tinker with the tax regime, introduce some of these reforms which have fundamentally altered the balances of taxation between sectors in the economy. And this time it is generally accepted, save and accept that the middle class professionals are not the happiest of persons out by the changes that were introduced. But my point is, my point is that nothing happens before it's time and the circumstances were propitious were just right that these taxation amendments were enacted by this parliament and are currently now in force, imperfect as they may be. So, Mr. Speaker, that's the lesson. Nothing happens before it's time. And we politicians constantly, constantly have to look at the balance of forces. We have to look at the, the, the mood of people, the sentiments to cast judgment on whether we take one step forward or we take two steps backward and wait for the right moment. But there's nothing like being vindicated in politics. Nothing. The pain sometimes is that the vindication comes long after the event when the damage has been done. And this is where I guess politicians have to be exceedingly generous because the whole world takes time to evaluate them but they ever had ever take time to evaluate the whole world. That's the, the, tri the, that's the tricky part of it. But vindication in politics is very, very rare. And I suspect every member in this house probably will have their moments of vindication. It may not come immediately, but it will come later, possibly on the rocking chair of retirement. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I was quite intrigued by the member for Suzel who spoke earlier when he offered his aha moments <laughs> because beneath his aha moments were those moments when perhaps um, like me in a few minutes he may quietly whisper I told you so.
Mr. Speaker, I say all of this to make a few observations on the policy announcement of the Minister of Finance that St. Lucian workers will have a new minimum livable wage by August 1st, 2024. No, I don't know if maybe for Bradley, but I'll tell you in a minute. Now, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker, that announcement was made by the Minister of Finance. But I go back for a moment um, to reflect on how important this is. This is good news to many workers, particularly those who work with private security firms, gas stations, small restaurants, and those in retail services. Of course, those who involve in small business and medium-sized business establishments will, um, I am sure, welcome whatever adjustments that have to be made, but we shall see how it plays in the final analysis. And this is one issue, let me add, that workers frequently question me about whenever I am out, whether it is to the gas station or to the supermarket, inevitably I am confronted with this issue. When are we going to have a minimum wage? And it is pleasing, Mr. Speaker, that it is a Labour government taking this step precisely because of its unmatched record of addressing the needs of workers. And while I applaud the Minister of Finance, for taking us back into history, into the exploits of Sir George F. L. Charles, inevitably I too was drawn to the recent history of the St. Lucia Labour Party in the years gone by because it is a Labour administration that produced a Labour Code of which I will have to say much more about in a few minutes. But I said to you sometimes a politician is ahead of his time, a government is ahead of its time. That is a part of the costs and the burdens that we have to bear. In truth and in fact, a Minimum Wages Act was enacted by the former Labour government in 1999. The provisions of that Act, number 27 of 1999, now repealed, were absorbed into the Labour Code and codified as sections 68 to 89, two sections of which were quoted by the Minister of, of, of Finance. And here's my point. This is a milestone. The government is to be congratulated, even if we do not know what the eventual outcome will be. When this was first attempted, it met a hostile response. Today, 25 years later, it is better received because its value is better understood. Nothing, truly nothing happens before its time. So 25 years after a Labour government enacted minimum wages legislation, today it is understood that it is vitally necessary to the protection of workers in this country. I can well understand why you must take a moment of reflection to consider this simple little fact. The job of administering this new minimum livable wage will be that of the Labour Department. And the question is, will the Labour Department be able to cope with the complaints and queries that are bound to arise? And while I was unfortunately away when the Minister commenced her address, I happened to have arrived just at that point when she was sharing some reflections on the Labour Tribunal. I want to share some reflections too. Share my experience with the administration of the Labour Court, my experience as a practitioner 
um, in labor law and my experience as a legislator over the years. I raise this question because it seems to me that the Labor Department is at this time simply overwhelmed with complaints and disputes awaiting resolution. Numerous decisions, both at the level of the Labor Commissioner and the Tribunal are outstanding. I can cite to you complaints made to the Labor Commissioner two years ago that have not seen the light of day. I can cite to you adjudications that have been made by the Labor Commissioner, but parties are unable to get decisions. Now, don't interpret the situation in a pejorative way. Don't. Because what we did as legislators legislators when we enacted the labor code is that we ended up burdening the labor commissioner with a task that he was he or she was ill prepared to undertake because we transformed the labor commissioner virtually into a first instance judge the result is that as workers begin to discover the value and benefits of the Labor Code or Labor Act, they are flooding the department with complaints and with issues to, do, to be resolved. The department seems unable to deal with a torrent of labor disputes reaching the desk of the Labor Commissioner. And I believe that the mistake that was made the mistake which was made was the decision to make the Labor Commissioner the adjudicator of disputes at first instance. The whole of the post is too consumed in hearing and rendering decisions in disputes that he or she does not really have the time to attend to the vital job of managing the department and implementing the provisions of the legislation. We have adjustments to be made. Mr. Speaker, this is not only issue compromising the full benefits of the Labor Act. And I add very quickly that there are a number of other defects in the ad drafting and administration of the Act that have become evident. The good thing is the department is aware of these problems and to their credit they have identified provisions which require amendments. But we cannot allow this centerpiece of the Labour Party to be, to be disrupted, to be rendered ineffective because of the problems that exist. This is too sacred an initiative for the Labour Party to allow to continue to exist without attending to it. I really do believe, Mr. Speaker, that a tripartite committee should be assembled and empowered at the soonest to make recommendations to reform the code. And I think in a previous conversation on this issue, I did say it was a low hanging fruit that should be quick, that should be picked very, very quickly for the sake of the workers of this country. But in any event, even if we take that path, we need to bring relief to the Labor Commissioner. And we have to resist the temptation to blame the Labor Commissioner. We have to resist it. It is simply a case that there are too many cases brought before him to adjudicate. He cannot handle it. The number is impossible. How do you do it? In my view, I be, in my view, the Labor Commissioner ought to be spared that responsibility. I believe that the Act should be amended swiftly to create and appoint at least three what I call dispute adjudicators to replace the Labor Commissioner who should be left to manage the Department and implement the Act in the manner prescribed by Parliament. 
Each adjudicator can then be assigned the responsibility to hear and determine the number of cases. And I believe that these adjudicators at first instance should in fact be lawyers if it is possible to recruit lawyers to that position. I also believe, Mr. Speaker, that we have added to the complexity of the process. You have, the process requires you to engage the Labor Commissioner, first off. If you are dissatisfied, the next stop is then the Labor Tribunal. If you are dissatisfied with the Labor Tribunal, then the next stop is the High Court. If you are dissatisfied with the High Court, then your next stop becomes the Court of Appeal. And nowadays, if you are dissatisfied with the Court of Appeal, your next stop would be in the Caribbean Court of Justice. As you can see, lots of rounds. I don't, I don't think the, the workers of this country deserve this. We may, be, we may believe that we are giving them so, so many opportunities that somehow it is in their interest. That's not so. One of the biggest problems with the Labor Code is the cost of engaging lawyers to represent, um, to represent workers. And this is a matter, one of those matters that have to be resolved in, in any amendments to the Labor Code. What do you do about this issue of costs? What do you do when you succeed before the Labor Commissioner and 18 months pass, you cannot get a decision from the Labor Commissioner, so you cannot pursue your costs? What do you do? I believe that the process really should be dispute adjudicators at the first instance, the Labor Tribunal at the second instance, and appeals should go directly from the Labor Tribunal to the Court of Appeal by passing the wrong of a high court judge. We need to reform and rethink this legislation. And this has nothing to do with, with the minister or, or casting blame, nothing not to do with that. It has to do with defects which we did not anticipate at the point of enactment. But the point is, it is now causing major frustration in the system, in the decision-making system. And we cannot forget our commitment to resolving the issues and problems of the workers of this country. We have to maintain that impeccable record. There's not a single piece of legislation, possibly they might say the Contracts of Service Act, which is really important more for middle class professionals, but there's not a single piece of legislation that the other party, the United Workers Party, could cite to say that they enacted this in. In the, in the interest of the workers of this country. I don't think there's any on the statute books. As I said, yes, they enacted something called our contracts, um, um, labor contracts, but whatever the case is, but really that was for middle class professionals who are entering into the realm of formal contracts. So Mr. Speaker, I hope that in the next few weeks, some attention would be paid to this, to this issue because as the workforce becomes more sophisticated, more complex, it is going to be even more critical that the machinery that we place at their disposal works efficiently. I shift focus, Mr. Speaker. I told you I would be eclectic. And I now turn to the year, the declaration of the year of infrastructure. Speaker, as you know, Minister of Finance has designated this as a year of infra infrastructure. I believe this is a welcome development. It is a major policy plan of the government for this financial year. This initiative is, not, is critical not only to restore the integrity of our road network, build public confidence, but most importantly to provide employment, to the army of small contractors and masons in our midst. And I continue to plead for them as I did on the last occasion that we must get these individuals busy. Ultimately, and this is the government's thinking rationale, this investment will drive domestic economic growth in the short term. 
I believe too it is a wise and good strategy to sustain and expand GDP, GDP growth. I am sorry, Mr. Speaker, that I will miss the contribution of the member for Castries North as I shall not be attending Parliament tomorrow. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, I must travel to Trinidad and Tobago to join a team of lawyers who will be representing the former CLECO policyholders before the Caribbean Court of Justice. The policyholders were shut out of seeking a legal remedy by the traditional means through the courts of Trinidad and Tobago, so they have had to invoke the Treaty of Chagoramas to determine their rights for what occurred during the Clico debacle. And finally, the matter is being heard on Monday and Tuesday, and it becomes essential that preliminary preparations are made for that, for the hearing. You will, I believe, Mr. Speaker, understand my regret. I believe you share with me a wish to hear the member on how his ministry will tackle the road issues in my constituency. After all, I've been raising this for nearly three years, year in, year out, and now I believe he has a plan. He hasn't told me what it is, but I suspect tomorrow he will make the big announcements. <laughs> I am also sorry that I will not be present when other ministers explain how they plan to address the issues in my constituency. Before South, I have asked my constituents to monitor closely what all the ministers say and to update me on each pronouncement. So tomorrow will be a big day. Member for Castries North. The member for Castries South. The member for Viewfort North. The member for Castries Central. All of them. And of course, Oh, yes! <laughs> yes, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, you are errant. You should have drawn my attention. The member for Grosile, the minister responsible for youth and sport, he has to make some big pronouncements tomorrow. So my constituents, well, the member for Labri, Saldibus, will be on a flight tomorrow. I don't know whether he will ever make a landing safely tomorrow, <laughs> but we shall see. But I am pleased to report to this House, Mr. Speaker, that one minister has already reported, and believe it or not, it is the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. He has assured me that even though he did not mention the commencement of the construction of the administrative complex for therefore South, later during the year, the first steps to construction will commence. I, I have his authority, Mr. Speaker, to say what I just said. He has an opportunity for a rebuttal so he can deny and he can denounce. But, Mr. Speaker, I will say... Why did you say why, why, why? <laughs> you learn it? But you're in the wrong company. <laughs> you're in the wrong company, my friend. When I heard you this afternoon, I said to myself, but why is he a member of the United Workers' Party? I don't understand. You have to explain that to me one of these days. <laughs> to return, Mr. Speaker, to center stage, to the issue of infrastructure, I agree that the program in infrastructure is truly ambitious. Whether the program will be successfully implemented will depend on the capability, the resources, and leadership of the managerial and technical staff of the ministry. In this regard, I also share the concerns of the Minister of Finance, and I think there are two issues that stand out in the, his address to this House. Mr. Speaker, you see, sometimes 
When we have budget addresses, you must analyze carefully what ministers of finance say. They're usually very guarded with, with language. And they're usually very obtuse, sometimes even oblique. But they also send messages, not just to parliament, but to ministries, to departments, etc. Now listen to the Minister of Finance in respect of one matter I will quote. The first is the likely cost of the East Coast Road. He said at page 53, and I'm going to read it out to you, and this is the ancillary Soufre Road. This is what he said. Sorry, the West Coast Road. I keep on calling it East, the West Coast Road. Mr. Speaker, it is intended that the rehabilitation of roadworks from ancillary to Soufre will be part of an additional two other phases. Mr. Speaker, let me inform the honorable members that the contract for this road was negotiated, tendered, and awarded under the last administration. Take that in your pipe and smoke it. However, I have been informed by officials of the Ministry of Economic Development that, quote, the project has exceeded its initial costing before. Therefore, a financing gap of approximately U.S. $10.048 million, or EC20, $7.12 million exists. Meaning that at present prices, there is already a cost overrun of $27 million to complete the road. Unquote. Now, why do I highlight this? You might say the Minister of Finance is protecting himself, wanting to act with considerable prescience by anticipating what will happen inevitably and protecting his administration. But I'm not surprised by the pronouncement. Sometimes when those of us engage in I told you so episodes, we are condemned for arrogance. When you say, I told you so, why you did it, I told you so. The, the response is, you are arrogant, you always believe you know. But on some occasions, the I told you so can be sweet. <laughs> and it is sweet now, I'll tell you why. When I sat on the opposition benches, during the last term, and told the then government, of which the Honorable Member for Castries North was a minister, that the road would exceed the estimated costs, they laughed at me, scoffed, and reminded me of my alleged history of cost overruns. Yes, he was. <laughs> he was. The Member for Castries North. Oh, you, even, you see, I speak the truth. He remembers that I was assaulted and assailed by the then member for Castro South, Guy Joseph. South East, Guy Joseph. Yes, that can never happen. It's only, it's only those who administer cost overruns. And today, even before the project start, we have been told, that there will be cost overruns of $27 million. And yes, I heard that by professionals. So today, even before construction of the road is in full swing, the Minister of Finance says that the road will cost $27 million more than originally estimated. Mr. Speaker, I will make another prediction. I predict it will cost even more. Mark my words. What's a Creole saying that they have au cap du vent? Avant du vent. Avant du vent. Minister, Mr. Minister of Finance, I agree with you. Point du, point du vent. Avant du vent. Point du vent. <laughs> You're right. Take in front. What a beautiful term. Eh? Point du vent. Avant du vent. Point du vent. Yeah, what a beautiful term. <laughs> Why are you likely to incur additional costs, Mr. Speaker? Unforeseen events are bound to occur, and the rising cost of equipment, materials, and labor will inevitably impact on the construction costs. 
I only hope, Mr. Speaker, that the administration is spared the ignominy that I went through when a commission of inquiry was launched against the construction of that road and it is not repeated. The second pronouncement is the establishment of planning and design units in the Ministry of Infrastructure. This is what the Minister of Finance said. Again, let us take a look at page 53, immediately below the statement on the ancillary superior. This is what the Minister of Finance said. Mr. Speaker, given the experience of projects, quality and time, a planning and design unit will be established to provide additional support staff to ensure better oversight of projects to allow for an improvement in the rate of implementation and the quality of project outputs. This unit will also provide technical assistance and support to the existing staff of the Ministry of Infrastructure. Unquote. I believe that the Minister of Finance will agree with me that this model has been tried before. It's not the first time that these special project units have been created in the Ministry of Infrastructure. Not the first time. The question that I have, Mr. Speaker, is whether the time has not come for us to rethink how we do things in some ministries. Have we not arrived at a point where we reevaluate our processes of governance? Have we reached that point? Mr. Speaker, we are talking about constitutional reform and so on, and I hope when I get an opportunity to share my views that it will be understood when I say that we have to bring an end to the corrupt permanent secretaries in the public service, that henceforth all permanent secretaries should be appointed along with the term of the government in office, so that you can be guaranteed that the program of the government will be attended to. And we led the way when we experimented, and of course, we were repudiated in 2006 and went back to the old system which we now have, and we are afraid to experiment. The reality is, we know that the Ministry of Infrastructure has a historical problem with the implementation of projects. It has been so from time immemorial. It has nothing to do with the current minister. He inherited it. And he has to live with it. He has to apply it as he found it. It has nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with the fact that the ministry is not organized or designed to conceptualize and implement projects. The model has failed us. What then is the alternative? Because it becomes a permanent, a pertinent, relevant and valid question because of the huge responsibilities that has been placed on the shoulders of the minister to ensure that this year of infrastructure is a success. That's the reality, and he's going to need all the support that he can get. I thought I might share with honorable members, Mr. Speaker, an approach that has been adopted in Trinidad and Tobago. The Trinidad government has opted to create a company owned by the government and to endow it with the powers to plan, design, and implement projects by using the tools of the private sector. In other words, you have the traditional Ministry of Infrastructure, you create a company, and you task that company to design and implement your project outside of the strictures of the public service, and you make the allocation of funds to that company. The company becomes the executing arm of the Ministry for, for particular projects, not all projects, outside the structures and norms of the public service. 
I believe that this approach merits evaluation to determine its feasibility for adaptation in our circumstances. But let me put in a, a cautionary note. Because we have history before us. Mr. Speaker, if that route is ever taken, there will have to be appropriate checks and balances to protect the entity from what I described as wayward Remember you ministers. have 15 minutes left. What did you say? <laughs> what did you say, Mr. Speaker? I know you lose sense of time when you're having fun, but 15 minutes. Oh. And then, and you stopped me at a delicate point, Mr. Speaker, because I was about to explain to all of the members that if you create a company like that, you have to introduce appropriate checks and balances in the event that you have wayward ministers at the helm. And I suspect you know who I'm talking about. Oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, in case you really don't understand what I'm trying, could you imagine, Mr. Speaker, a guy Joseph in charge of such an entity? No, I did not invite comments from the member for Castries. For Castries. Mr. Speaker, I rather like the expansive definition of investments in infrastructure offered by the Minister of Finance in his presentation. If you look at page 18, Mr. Speaker, page 18, he says that infrastructure does not only refer to roads, bridges, drains, and culverts, but extends to digital public infrastructure, civil status, where government services, telecommunication, housing infrastructure, health, hospitals, education, economic, agriculture, fishing facilities, jetties, social transformation, citizen security, all of those things. I'd rather like that. The only thing I say that I would say is that there's one omission, that is the provision of legal services. I have in the past complained about the delays being experienced by lawyers to execute conveyances because of the unnecessary bureaucratic impositions of the National Insurance Corporation and the Inland Revenue Department. We do not seem to understand that these impositions, which are not statutorily recognized or approved, are causing huge delays in the execution of conveyances, contributing to St. Lucia's reputation as an unfriendly place to do business. Government revenue also suffers immeasurably. Mr. Speaker, some attention needs to be paid to the land registry. In recent times, the delays in obtaining public documents have become unacceptable. When these delays are added to the time it takes to secure compliance documents from the Inland Revenue Department and the NIC, then it becomes easier to understand why lawyers are frustrated by the delivery of these services. While some steps have been taken to deal with the administrative issues in the department, the underlying problems remain. No one seems to be taking the pleas of the Bar Association seriously. I don't know why lawyers are being ignored like this. It baffles me. I will give you an example of the kind of problems. It is nigh difficult to get from the land registry copies of instruments to execute deeds and other conveyancing documents. Why? Rightly, the department has asked that you apply for these documents online. This is excellent. But there will be no one to answer your email, none at all. Weeks pass by, months sometimes, and you can't get the instruments in your hands to execute the documents while the banks and the clients are, are putting maximum pressure on you, Mr. Speaker. This foolishness has to end. I urge that a meeting be convened with the Bar Association of the Sooners to hear their concerns and complaints before the services offered by that department comes to a grinding halt. That department requires a systematic and major overhaul. It can no longer wait. These comments, Mr. Speaker, bring me closer to the halls of justice. Again, Mr. Speaker, I applaud the government for its decision to design and construct the halls of justice. I'm sure the judiciary will breathe a sigh of relief and 
quietly mutter at last, at long last. And as I said in my opening remarks, nothing happens before it's time. The model which is being used to finance, design, and construct the halls of justice is tried and tested. It was employed by a previous Labour government to finance the construction of the Ministry of Infrastructure at Union and the car park here in Castries. Both of these buildings are now fully owned by the public sector. So, it is a tried and tested model of financing for projects of this type, pioneered by a former Labour government. But Mr. Speaker, I have on previous occasions in this House made it clear that I would not be a hypocrite to what I believe and what I once championed, unless of course there are compelling and overwhelming reasons to change my mind. I have to be faithful to what I believe, what I hold in my breast. If, Mr. Speaker, there are compelling reasons to change, take a different route, I will say so and admit it. So sometimes when I make my comments, it is against, for me, that sacred philosophical position. As much as I welcome the halls of justice, I have grave reservations about the selected site. I believe that the selection of the site presents challenges, not just access and parking, but also space constraints. I know that the billing will cost an estimated $145.8 million. The cost of piling is bound to be significant as the water table of Castries continues to rise. I do not wish to cause any alarm, but I do believe that the water table in the Castries Basin is rising and presenting unique challenges to the design and construction of the foundations of all new buildings in the city. But that is a layman's view, an observer, somebody looking and familiar with Castries and looking at it. And all these problems we are having with offices, with, with, with problems of, of, what you call it again? Mold, etc., has a lot to do with that unless the foundations of those buildings are properly secured. A decision having been made, which is the right of the government to do, the government has opted to take that route. And that is its choice and there can be no quarrels with it. I would nevertheless say for what it is worth that a committee of non-technical personnel comprising persons who are familiar with the design and operation of courts should be selected to review systematically and carefully the spatial allocations proposed by the architect of the building. This is not a matter which should be left to engineers. These are not engineering decisions. A design has to respect the logic of the structure of the courts. Courts have a hierarchical structure. The lower courts comprising the magistracy, the high court, and then the court of appeal. A design should not conflate the system of courts. Likewise, a commercial court should not be positioned next to a family court. Why would you do that? The two are incompatible, as they provide for two different streams of litigants and personnel. Indeed, given the nature of a family court, it should have its own space and operational environment. So, Mr. Speaker, the decision having been made, I believe that we have to ensure that we get good value for money. I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, because inevitably the construction of the halls of justice invited us to look, to reflect on the future. And I hope this government can be, can be a pioneer as, it's, as the predecessor governments were, and I'll come to that in a few minutes. I believe we should look to the future. There's no question that the people of St. Lucia need a new and dedicated parliamentary building. What we have as Parliament today does not reflect who or what we are or what we want to be. Civilizations are also known by their physical edifices. All I'm doing, Mr. Speaker, is to urge that we should begin the process to design a proper Parliament to conduct the parliamentary business of the country. Let's take the first step to do a concept brief of a new Parliament for the people of this country. 
And of course, the second major public sector inv investment has to be the Center for the Creative and Performing Arts. Mr. Speaker, I beg this government to, to be proactive. The former Labour government had reserved a site overlooking Massey Mega for the complex. We had gone as far as to get a design brief from the Taiwanese who had agreed to finance the design. It was shared with the artistic community. Lo and hold, the former government came into office and on the urgings again of the member for cash resources, you all believe that the former Prime Minister has sins, but no one is yet compiling the sins of the member for Castries Southeast. I will not engage in any statements. That will no, Mr. Speaker. I will. You have five minutes, Mr. So, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, let me. Uh, yes, I will need more time, Mr. Speaker, about 15 minutes. Mr. Speaker, I am reminded that in 1999, the Labour government commissioned a vision plan for cast trees. 15 more minutes, yes. Well, Speaker, the plan was prepared by NLBA into island architects Paul Hippolyte and Mervyn Williams, an, an urban planner and a brilliant son of this country. This was followed by the Hyder Report prepared for the Ministry of Physical Development in December 2007. Still other reports followed. There is, I believe, the Castries Vision 2030 prepared in 2018. The GPA investment to Port Castries will bring the NLBA plan to life. According to the Minister of Finance, the GPA investment, and I want to quote him on it, GPH, Government of St. Lucia investment will see the upgrade of Port Castries and Sufre waterfront. Well, knock out Sufre for the time being. I'm only focusing on Castries. This project will bring, will require dredging at Point Serafin, the building of a boardwalk from San Jose Bridge to the Vendors Arcade, rebuilding and expanding the Vendors Arcade, building of Fing the Piers at the Arcade, demolition of the old customs building, and rebuilding of a new customs building, creating a creation of parking lots, construction constructing a fisherman's village at Banan and the total upgrade of the Supra waterfront, which for my purposes I will exclude. Mr. Speaker, the ideas mentioned here all come from the NLBA proposals by a forward-thinking Labour government in 1999. NLBA owns these ideas and it is fitting that Neville Skeet, Claude Guillaume, Paul Hippolyte, Bourbon Williams are properly recognized, given credit, and acclaimed for these proposals. Perhaps in time we can name the boardwalk after Neville Skeet and Claude Guillaume to remember their unique contribution to the redevelopment of Castries. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm coming close down. I know the revolution in education continues. The legacy of the SLP in education remains unmatched untouched. And when you're talking about legacy, look to education where, well, it is so pronounced. In this budget presentation, considerable attention has been devoted to education by the Minister of Finance. In fact, the attention rivals the pronouncements of infrastructure. I applaud the Minister for his transformational initiatives, particularly for creating specialized institutes of training and to match skills with jobs. I welcome, too, the announcement that there will be major repairs to three schools in my constituency, Beanfield Secondary, Plain View Combined, and my alma mater, View Fort Comprehensive. I await clarification of the status of repairs to the building next to the Kimitri Hotel, which was affected by the storm. I have to say this is one minister I repeat, I have to say that this is one minister who regularly keeps me in touch with, keeps in touch with me to apprise me and update me on developments in education in my constituency. He respects the parliamentary representative.
Mr. Speaker, despite, Mr. Speaker, despite my lean appearance, the minister has heightened my appetite for more transformational changes. I look forward to the return of cake examinations to our secondary schools. Centralization of A-levels may have been justified in the early days when a few secondary schools existed, but not so now. We are denying secondary schools of badly needed student leadership and competitive opportunities to excel. This passion for so-called meritocracy is nothing more than a cloak for mindless uniformity. While educational institutions should provide opportunities and certification for all in accordance with their abilities, they also have a responsibility to discover, nurture, and promote excellence. I do not have the time, Mr. Speaker, but I know the Minister of Education has a merit list of how schools performed in the Caribbean, and he has a lot to report in the Viewport Comprehensive Secondary School. I am not surprised, hardly surprised, Mr. Speaker, by this outstanding performance. Mr. Speaker, I'm almost there. I promise you, Mr. Speaker. I will touch one final matter before I close. Towards the end of his presentation, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance advised that the government is giving consideration to the creation of a sovereign wealth fund. He said it as follows, I think it is, at page 73. And it's short, Mr. Speaker. For the last two years, we have been speaking about the creation of a sovereign wealth fund to create a multi-generational plan that would safeguard future generations. We are pursuing this initiative and have employed experienced advisors to assist. A memo is to be considered by Cabinet to approve the way forward. I will update members on the progress of this initiative. While I have in the past been skeptical about the creation of such a fund, I have noted the mounting interest in such funds as traditional sources of financing and wealth creation drive. It is another idea whose time may have come. It is my understanding, Mr. Speaker, that other states of the OECS are also considering the establishment of a sovereign wealth fund. Given capacity limitations, it seems to me that it would be eminently sensible if the OECS could agree to establish a single sovereign wealth fund for the region as a whole. Mr. Speaker, I am closing. Mr. Speaker, I once said that every budget presentation has a philosophical soul. Beneath it is a philosophy, an expression of the philosophy of the Minister of Finance. Ministers of Finance usually share with the public the vision of the government of the day for the ensuing budgetary cycle. Some philosophies are easier to identify and define than others. For example, I had a hard time identifying the philosophy of the former government when it was in office. But that's another story for another time. Undoubtedly, Mr. Speaker, this Minister of Finance has brought bread, justice, and freedom to all in total satisfaction of the creed to which he ascribes. Those who are hungry, he fed them in this budget. Those who are crying out for justice, he heard them. Those who wanted freedom from abuse, oppression, and insults, he has offered protection. I think, Mr. Speaker, of the workers who will be protected by minimum wages. The pensioners and elderly who are often forgotten. The young people who are in search of opportunities. The professionals who seek to advance their careers and utilize their skills. The farmers who are crying out for help as they undergo another cycle of adjustment. The motoring public who have shared their frustrations with the deterioration of our public highways. The most innocent among us, our children, particularly our preschoolers. The elderly poor and marginalized whose homes were repaired or rebuilt. Our students who are guaranteed their laptops. In my view, Mr. Speaker, don't ring the bell. This Minister of Finance has passed the ultimate test. He will not only touch lives, but most importantly, transform them. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your patience and your understanding.